sorry. Now that you can hear me, you guys like my graphic? I made that on the computer. When I was going through and looking for Happy Mother's Day, Mother's Day graphics and that sort of thing, there's a lot of real pretty ones out there. There's a lot of graphics with flowers and butterflies and and mountains and meadows and, you know, all the things that you think of when you think of mothers, you know, like mountains and meadows and, and, uh, you know, all those, the big tall grasses and the meadows just made me think I need to mow my grass. And I thought about what that, what the graphics, what the, the ornateness of the, uh, of the, the picture that I was going to choose to illustrate Mother's Day and Happy Mother's Day, what, what it really means. And this is all that I could come up with because I want to I make this particular point right off the bat. This is an absolutely absurd day to recognize. Seriously? Honor, honor uh, women, mothers... Why? None of this matters without that. That makes this a real big day. The fact that we serve a risen Lord who renews everything about this experience because without the the empty tomb, without Jesus living, dying, and, and overcoming death, We can honor anybody we want to. None of it matters. But because our God overcomes this life, because our God redeems us from the fear of death, from the the futility of, of, of mortality, days like today can be special days. Because without this, Mother's Day, Father's Day, and it, it's meaningless. But with it, it means everything. Because it's those godly women in our lives, and, and godly men too, but today, guys, it's not about us. It's about the women because godly women teach us the reality of the fact that we are created for more than just this life. And the triumphant empty tomb proves that because, thank God, he is still risen and the resurrection of jesus redeems not only our lives but redeems every single day that we celebrate and hold dear and hold special so this morning as we celebrate mothers and as we celebrate uh grandmothers and godly women in our lives and 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 all of the people that that have poured into us i want it to be with the backdrop of the empty tomb and the reality of the fact that The resurrection doesn't just change everything on one specific day. The resurrection changes everything on every day. The resurrection gives meaning to not just Easter, but the resurrection gives meaning and purpose to every day that we live, every day that we celebrate, every reason that we come together. So this morning as we celebrate uh, we celebrate the the story that keeps changing as we think about the fact that that our god redeemed us from a futile life of sin and death that in that story you know we've talked about under the 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 whole umbrella of of narratives in this world change and the stories keep changing and our story our story of redemption of a of a god who pursues us it keeps changing too but not the facts the, the, what, the, what the story is changes us. And this morning, faithful mothers change things. Faithful women, and, and I want to, and I always want to include all women in, in this, in a Mother's Day sermon, because there are, uh, there are women who for, for one reason or another are unable to have children, and, and that, that doesn't preclude them from being honored as a, or doesn't exclude them from being honored as a godly woman. And, and, and there are women who have gone on and all of those things. So in all aspects of womanhood, I believe, is to be honored on this day, especially motherhood. The faithful mothers change things. 
They change not only uh, the circumstances that we might encounter, but, but they change the lives of those that they pour themselves into. And we see that over and over again. Oh, I didn't mean to hit that. So as we did last week, we looked at the, the Exodus story. And we looked at the, uh, the, the fact that, that Pharaoh was using fear and, and, and distrust and all that to leverage, uh, to leverage his people to oppress the Jews. And then we, we came across the story of, uh, of, of these two midwives who, who stood up to him. And you know, remember because Pharaoh wanted all the baby boys to, to go away. He said to the midwives, I want you to kill the baby boys as they, as they are born. The, the girls let live, but the boys, uh, I, I want you to kill them. Well, they wouldn't do that. And so finally, he said, well, they just throw all the baby boys in the Nile. And they, and, and they wouldn't. And so here we have, after all of that's going on, in the, in the middle of that genocide, in the middle of that edict, you have in chapter 2, in Exodus, we're going to see an example, and I'm going to make a few points out of the life of, uh, of, of Amram and Jochebed. The lasting effect of faithful moms on, the, on not only their children, but the generation in which they are a part of. Starting in Exodus chapter 2 and verse 1, Now a man of the house of Levi married a Levite woman, and she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. When she saw that he was a fine child, a, a, and, a, and not just any ordinary child, she hid him for three months. But when she could hit, hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him, coated it with tar and pitch. Then she placed the child in it and put him among the reeds along the bank of the Nile. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. When Pharaoh's daughter went down to the Nile to bathe, and her attendants were walking along the river bank. She saw the basket and among the reeds and sent her slave girl to get it. She opened it and saw the baby. He was crying and she felt sorry for him. This is one of the Hebrew babies, she said. Then his sister asked Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go get some of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? Yes, go, she answered. And the girl went and got the baby's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this baby and nurse him for me, and I will pay you. So the woman took the baby and nursed him. When the child grew older, she took him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. She named him Moses, saying, I drew him out of the water. Think about all that's going on in that story. So there's this overall de declaration made by Pharaoh and I'm afraid that so oftentimes in, in our minds, Pharaoh just becomes this, this cartoon character of, of, uh, you know, of this you know, kooky-looking Egyptian guy uh, with makeup on and some kind of you know, headdress, and he's just some caricature of, uh, of a character that we read about, and we just think about, oh, yeah, he's a mean guy. Think about the, I mean, all, roll all of the, the, the devious... Uh, just mean dictators and, uh, and leaders you've ever heard of in all of history. All of the Stalins and the Marxes and the, uh, the Hitlers and the uh, Pol Pot and all of that rolled all into one. This is, a, this is an evil, evil, ungodly leader, ungodly king. And the problem is, is that he's the most powerful individual on the planet. Not just a cartoon character that, that's, you know, you know, Ebenezer Scrooge. We're talking about a person who would, de who would declare the death of an entire generation. I mean, that, that kind of evil, that kind of power, that kind of, that kind of person. So imagine Amram comes home from work one day, hard day of making bricks. I mean, his feet's killing him, his back's hurting. And he walks in, and he sees his wife there, and she's got this look on her face. It's a look of, uh, of, of fear, of, of terror, of excitement, of worry, uh, of all kinds of things rolled. You know, he's, he's never seen this look before because they've never been in this situation because the most 
powerful, most evil, personified person on earth has declared the absolute murder of now what she's dealing with. And Amram says, what, what, what's going on, honey? What, what are you doing? What's, what's wrong? What's good? What's what? Because you can't read the facial expression because think about all the things that are going on in her mind because she's pregnant. And she tells him, she says, I, I, I'm pregnant. Well, in those days, you had no way of knowing the sex of the baby. So she and he have to live for nine months wondering wondering I mean, moms think about it is it you, you mean you find out you're you're pregnant you're going to have a baby you're in this situation i mean you're in a situation you're married you got i mean they already had two children you're going to add to your your family i mean what isn't that i mean i remember getting those uh getting those calls i mean you know I, or not calls i mean that's not big called me and said hey guess what no we didn't like talk on the phone but i remember having those conversations and I remember the joy of just, I mean, Steve, you remember that? When you got the news, like, we're, 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 we're pre- we're, we are pregnant. And, and, and we are. And I, I got, I'm still working on my baby weight, just so you know. I mean, our, our children are getting a little old, but I'm still, because we got pregnant. But it's exciting, isn't it? Oh, it's a thrill, and you just, you can't wait to tell everybody, and, and, and you know, and in our case, we were like, well, you know, we're, we kind of can, because everybody's going to say, again? I mean, and then, you know, oh, y'all know what causes that? I mean, yeah, we get it, yeah. We got a lot of kids. Everyone's a comedian. It's exciting, though, isn't it? I mean, you just can't wait to tell people, and put it on Facebook, and then you get the sonogram, and you're like, oh, here's a little peanut, and, uh, and then, you know, you're, but, but they had none of that. You know, because that first little baby bump pops out. It's not a time of excitement. It's still, still worry. Still fear. I mean, still the stress. What happens if this is a boy? Could you imagine living through that? Living through the stress of, uh, of, of knowing that, that the, your child's ethnicity plus its sex could mean it's demise. Could you imagine being pregnant in, in uh, Eastern Europe during the late 1930s when Hitler's moving across, killing all of those Jewish people? Could you imagine being a pregnant mother in Rwanda during that genocide? Could you imagine being a pregnant woman uh, in, in the, during the history of our country that we have to own where your ethnicity could mean the death of you, your children, w- w- the, a, a, a terrible life. Imagine in one of the most happiest times of your life being saddled with that kind of a culture, that kind of a reality, and having to deal with that for nine months, and yet they did. The Bible says that they hid the baby as long as they could. Uh, for, for three months they, they hid his existence, but once they, they couldn't any longer, Jacobed took a basket, made it up, coated it with with tar and with pitch and she put it in the in the river now she didn't she didn't just send him adrift as sometimes in vbs stories we we like to say you know there goes baby moses floating down the river he wasn't floating down the river she anchored him among the reeds there's no doubt that that jacobed knew the bathing habits of pharaoh's daughter there's no doubt that, that she, and so she did not place him in the basket to, in, in, in the river to hide him, uh, to conceal him. She placed him in the river, in the basket, so that he would be found. And I believe that it's, uh, it, it's very interesting and it's, it makes a great point that the one who would deliver Israel later has to be delivered himself. That's a whole other sermon that when you're ministering to people, the things that you have gone through, God uses because he's got a purpose for those. So Jacobed, she comes up with this plan. It reminds me of a story of, uh, of a family who's Loved one is in the hospital and they come out to find out that they need a, he needs a, a brain transplant. He said, wow, that sounds significant. 
go with me, okay, medical person? You know, you can go out there. For y'all visiting, that's my wife, and she gives me a hard time, therefore, anyway. So he needs a brain tra- See, this is what you do. He needs a brain transplant. They said, well, doc, that sounds expensive. What is it? He said, well, that depends on what kind of brain you get. So what, what do you mean what kind of brain? He says, well, uh, if you get a male's brain, you get a, you get a man's brain, that's going to be $2 million. He says, well, okay. He says, well, if you get a female's brain, you get a woman's brain, that's going to be $200,000. Like, what? He said, yeah, yeah. Why the price difference, doc? He said, well, it's just a standard industry uh, pricing system. You see, if, if you get a woman's brain, we have to... We, we have to significantly discount it because it's been so heavily used. Jochebed, Ken's like, oh, I can't this, I can't with this guy. He's like this guy. Jochebed's using her brain, guys. She's thinking within the situation that seems hopeless. That seems like there's no way for me to go up against what's going on here. There's no way. Jochebed figures out a way around the Pharaoh's edict. Figures out a way to get Moses in one of the safest places he could be physically. Yes, a dangerous place spiritually. But Jochebed figures out a way to circumvent Pharaoh's edict. Now, if you remember from last week, and I just can't help but make this point, ladies, do you like the fact that the most powerful man in the world keeps getting thwarted by these women? It was the midwives last week. It's this, it, it, it's this uh, uh, you know, mother, this, you know, uh, a no-name other than this mother this week. So w- women keep thwarting the plans the most powerful, most ruthless, most evil person in the world. And there's three things that I want to bring up that this faithful mother shows us through her actions and her activities. Faithful mothers insist God has a purpose for every child. You know, one of the things that we see that, you know, and the Hebrew writer later on would say that, you know, they hid him for, uh, well, let's just go over there, Hebrews chapter 11 I thought I was going to be able to, to memorize that, but now that my wife had to give me the side eye about my little joke there, I'm all dis- discombobulated. I just blame her. By faith, Moses' parents hid him for three months after he was born because they saw he was no ordinary child. The, the, uh, uh, the Exodus account says that they saw he was a special child. He was no ordinary child. He was a fine child. In, in Hebrews, you know, thousands of years later, they record the same thing. He was no ordinary child. Now, where, uh, uh <laughs> Sonia in the back there. Sonia, you direct our preschool. Every mama crow thinks her crow is the blackest, don't she? How in the world, I mean, every mom comes in and says, and now, have you ever had a mother come in and say, Sonia, this is little Jimmy, and he's a, you know, he's four years old, and there's just nothing special about him at all. <laughs> he's just basic and average, and he's probably going to be, uh, you know, terribly behaved, and, and you're not going to get really much out of him, but here you go. You ever had that conversation? No. Any preschool teachers ever, you're, you're, uh, uh, Hillary is your two-year-old teacher, right? And Hillary, how many times, now, I know he's only two, but he's way smarter than all the other two-year-olds. And, and if y'all have an advanced two-year-old class, he's going to need to go in that. And, and Hillary takes a child who's got, you know, Cheerios stuck to his ear and, you know, oh, look, the first word. No, no, it's not. But they see that... W- w- what is it about this child that's special? Maybe they understand that, that, uh, that why would God? I mean, because uh, children are a gift from God. The, t- the, the Bible tells us children are a gift from God. The toughest job you'll ever love. They understood why would God give us this gift in these circumstances. They understood if God is giving us this gift right now, Because we already have a son named Aaron. We already have a daughter named Miriam. I mean, they already have children. Why would God gift them this child right now? They spend 
the first few years of his life pouring into him that he has a purpose. That he's special. Has nothing to do with the conversations that I and many of you have had with your children about, oh, you can be anything you want to be. Oh, you can go out and, and you can conquer this world and, and you can be a doctor or a lawyer or this or that. You know, we, we talk to our children about all of the academic things that they can do and all of the careers that they can accomplish, all of the sports that they can dominate and all of those things. There's no doubt that Amram and Jochebed spent those first three years pouring into Moses that he has a purpose from the Almighty God. Do we spend that kind of time, moms and dads, pouring into our children? Because the Bible says later on, because they only had him for, it says that, the, that Jacob had weaned him. And in those days, you didn't wean a child for a few months, you weaned him for a few years. So, so the, the time that they had before they delivered him into Pharaoh's house was just a few years. Later on, Hebrews would say that Moses chose to be with his people rather than enjoy the sin of the palace for a season. How do you teach a toddler that much about the true and living God that sticks with him all the days of his life? Guys, I don't know, but they figured it out. Maybe they spent every minute they could because they knew the time was coming. When he would go away, when Pharaoh's daughter would, would want her son in the palace, they knew the stakes were high. I mean, think about the faith that it took to put Moses in that basket in the Nile. I mean, we think about that's some significant faith. But think about the even more faith she had to have to put Moses in Pharaoh's household. And we see throughout history that what they were able to pour into their child in the first few years of his life. And, and I tell, if, if I knew then what I know now, I'd be such a better dad. I tell expecting moms and dads, those, you know, because of this story right here, those first few years are so pivotal. I mean, I told a guy the other day, you do whatever. And Vic was there, and she looked at me. I told him, you do whatever you got to do. Remember, we were on the bus at Universal, and I said, you do whatever you got to do, because they're, you know, all pregnant and everything. And they're like, why would you come to Universal Studios and walk all 9,000 miles every day, big old pregnant? And I told him, I said, you do whatever you got to do. You quit your job, you get a different job, but you be with that child the first three, four years of its life, because they're gone, and you don't ever get them back. And there's something special, something impressionable about those first few years where you can pour into a child and it will put them on a path the rest of their life. Some of you here, I can, you know, the mothers whose, whose children have grown and left the house and you think, well, you know, I did, I did the best job I could. Okay, great. Now, prepare for that grandma role and what you know now more than what you know then and you can teach those your children to pour into those grandchildren and if they ain't doing it you pour into them yourself because it's that important faithful mothers insist every child has a purpose some parents might not mean to get pregnant but there's no such child as an accident okay i'm gonna say this one more time and I'm just letting you know, this is your cheat sheet. I expect us to process this quickly and then a boisterous amen, praise God, hallelujah, whatever. Parents might not mean to get pregnant, but there is no such child that is an accident. Amen. And it is with that reality that we combat the culture that we are in today. The culture of expendable life. The culture of, and, and it's not don't do this because it's wrong, but don't do this because God has a purpose for this child. And every unwanted pregnancy is a pregnancy purposed by God for greatness. 
And it's time for the church to quit telling people what to do, but show them there's a better way. Because people don't care what you think unless they think you care. Faithful mothers insist God's got a purpose for every child. Even though they're born into what would seem like the worst of circumstances. And see, another thing is that Amram and Jochebed did not passively resign to the demand of the prevailing culture to control the future of their children. Faithful mothers resist the enemy's attempt to claim the next generation. What are some ways that our enemy is trying to claim the next generation? What are the ways that, that the culture that we live in today, what are the ways that the, the pharaohs of the world are trying to take our children and plunge them into something that leads to certain death? Faithful moms and dads realize, hey, I'm not resigned to the enemy's attacks. And I will not allow them to claim the next generation. You see, they, they took matters into their own hands, so to speak. They didn't just leave it up to, to the prevailing culture. Think about the specific things that those parents did to protect that child from the circumstances that they were born into. By faith, the Bible says in Moses, or in, in Moses, in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 24, by faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be mistreated along with, uh, along with the people of God rather than enjoy the pleasure of sin for a short time. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as a greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his reward. Again, you see, Moses' parents spent time pouring into him so he understood the value of serving God rather than man. And when, and, and when them trying to, on their own, keep him a secret, when, when that was no longer possible, they built this basket. They covered it with tar and pitch. They, they weatherproofed it, and they, they put him in the reeds. What they did, the, the basket, what was this protective vessel for Moses during this this difficult time, and I think of all the baskets that have been built for me over the years. I think about all the baskets that my mother made for me to float me, to, to hide me in those reeds, to keep me safe. And, and it's simple baskets, like, like, the, like one basket I remember is my mom's Bible. My daughter has that Bible now, but I remember watching as she sat in church. I remember watching her look up the path, and we didn't have, you know, this back then in the, you know, the 70s and 80s. That's the 1970s and 1980s. We didn't have everything up on the screen, and so I remember mom looking, you know, when the preacher would say a verse or when the devotional for uh, communion meditation would say, you know, I, I remember her, and I sat next to her, I could, I could hear this, just, she was so, just so delicate with the pages, and you could hear that right there. I mean, I can, I can be somewhere, I'm just anywhere in a crowd, and I promise you, if thin rice paper-like Bible pages start turning or something, I, I could, I can hear that like a, like nobody, nothing else is in the room. I remember seeing her pull out a little pen and, and, high, and underline and make little notes in the margin. And her handwriting was so elegant. And she, it would, she would make the, the most thoughtful, poignant, con, concise notes in those margins. I remember that. And guys, if you go through my Bible to this day, I mean, it's like rainbow coalition in there. I mean, I've got pages or uh, colors and notes and all kinds of things. And that was a basket that she built teaching me what it looks like to, to value Scripture. To devour it, to, to pour over it, to think about it, to memorize it, to meditate on it. Another basket was church. I mean, back when I was a kid, we went to church. I mean, vacation, 
You go to you go on vacation, man. I I mean, I've been to church at the beach more times than I know how to, what to do. I mean, go in and and uh, you, and you never you know when you go into diff, you find different churches and they think different things and one's conservative and one's, you know and I can remember going and this one's like a you know well they're saying that, anyway we went to church. I mean, there was no ball team, there was no, uh, no anything that came before church. And I'm telling you, that was a basket because now one thing I hear myself saying to my kids, my two grown children who live in Nashville on their own, not under my roof, I, tell, I ask them, hey, what was church about this morning? And if they can't give me a good answer, you know what I say, Scott? Hey, we go to church. We go to church, not because you have to, not because it's a requirement, because we have, I'm I'm sorry, Steve, I got outside the thing there, I forgot. Because we have the privilege, we have the honor, we have the opportunity to go and interact with our faith family and praise the true and living God. We go to church. We go to church. I think, of, I think of other baskets that were built for me. I remember specifically a basket, my, uh, a Sunday school teacher at the Hoover Church of Christ. I can't remember his name, but I remember this guy when we were, when we were learning about something and we're sitting there in the classroom and, and, and somebody came in and, and said, you know, made an announcement about somebody in the church that had something. And I can't even remember, but I, all I remember was this guy said, we will pray about it right then. And he showed me an example of we stopped everything. I couldn't have been more than, oh my goodness, seven, eight, nine years old, something like that. We stopped everything. We didn't talk about our lesson again. All we did was pray for the rest of that class. We went around the circle and prayed. He prayed. We held hands and prayed, and it, remi- it, re- it, it revealed to me the important. This was a Sunday school teacher who believed in the power of prayer. How are we resisting the enemy's attempt to claim the next generation? What baskets? What baskets are being built for you guys? This morning, I had the, 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 the guys in my class write, write down some specific things about mothers and all that, and I want you guys to think about this. The rest of this week, I want you to, to, to inventory the baskets that have been built for you. The things that have, have been built by your moms and dads to protect you from the, cult, the prevailing culture that you'll experience. Moms and dads, I want you to think about the baskets that you've built for your kids. And I want you to inventory those things so that when your kids are grown and they have their own kids and then you're a grandma or a grandpa, you can kind of think about and go back and talk to them about the things that they're doing for your grandchildren that will keep them in an ever-changing and more volatile culture. Faithful parents resist the, uh, the enemy's attempt to claim the next generation. And faithful mothers persist because they know God can deliver. Remember back when I read that long passage out of Exodus chapter uh, 2, 1 through 10? Go back and read that, the story of when Amram and they find out they're pregnant and they they go down through that whole thing. Not once is God mentioned. Not one time. Not one time is, is the name, the word, the idea, is God ever mentioned. In Exodus 2, 1 through 10, never, never does he come up. Do you ever feel like you're trying to do this all by yourself? Do you, maybe you don't. Maybe if you're here this morning, you're watching on TV. Maybe you, maybe you haven't. But, but have you ever, do you know anybody that could possibly be going through uh, and, and combating this culture with their children, feeling like that nobody sees and that God doesn't care and that he's nowhere around? Because one of the things that that we know, that we can teach, that we can display to the world is that no matter what we feel like is going on, God can deliver. God is always working on behalf of those who, remember last week, on those who fear him, whether we can see it or not. providential directing hand of our God is always present how does this story encourage you to remember that God is always at work 
In what situations of this life have you seen that seem hopeless or impossible? How can you give those over to God, to his care, to his plan, to his purpose? Because see, there's a purpose for every child. And the enemy, the enemy has no claim to the next generation. Because we know God can always deliver. The reality is that all of this, all of, all of this story, all of the, the fine sounding arguments and, 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 and examples that we might have come up with, all of that and the honor of this day is meaningless outside of the resurrection of our Lord and Savior. And this gives us, not only gives us hope, not only gives us uh, determination, but it gives us courage to do what Jochebed and Amram were able to do. And that is to meet a hostile culture head on and tell you, you've picked a fight with the wrong God. Pharaoh, you've picked a fight with the wrong God. This morning, somebody in your life has poured into you built a basket for you maybe they're here this morning you know what we're going to sing an invitation song and and maybe that person's here this morning go hug their neck maybe they're maybe you're related by blood maybe you're just related uh, by christ if they're here and there's somebody that has poured into you and, and you can't wait that's okay get up move around tell them let them know it's that important But remember, God has a purpose for each child he places on this earth, uh, even us old ones included. And the enemy, doesn't get the, the, the enemy doesn't get the next generation. I don't care what the culture says or what the circumstances look like. And can we be, can we be about depending on God even when we can't readily see that? This morning, maybe you didn't have the the privilege, the, the honor of having that godly mother in your life. Maybe, and, they, and they never led you through that reality of that death and burial and resurrection. And maybe there's a, a, this morning you realize today's the day. Today's the day that I begin the walk that will teach me the purpose of God. That will teach me how to combat the, 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 uh, the attacks of, of the enemy. That can teach you that God's always there. You need to confess Christ. Be, confess him as your Lord and Savior, and be baptized and go into that watery grave and come out a brand new person, whatever your need is this morning. You can let us know as we stand and as we sing. And if there's someone in this room this morning that needs to hear, thank you for my basket, go let them know as together we sing.